Good afternoon, good day, good morning, good whatever, wherever you are in the United States and beyond, uh, welcome. I am very, very pleased to do the um, opening salvo for this discussion today. <clears throat> um, I'm David Dukas. I am the director of the program in medical ethics and human values. And I am here to um, let you know about the J.R. Williams Senior uh, Class of 31 Endowed Lecture Series uh, for the talk Ethical Considerations in Caring for Incarcerated Individuals by Dr. Niyogi. And Vid will be doing the full and lengthy introduction in just a moment for the doc, good doctor. Next. Stephen, there we go. So we are blessed to have an endowed lecture series from the J.R. Williams uh, family. Um, this was a lectureship that was kicked off in uh, 2013. Uh, the endowment was uh, intended to support lectures specifically on spirituality and health, but we also do things on medical ethics and medical humanities with this lecture series here at Tulane School of Medicine. We focus on the art of creating a compassionate and trusting relationship between patient and doctor, and this definitely, this topic falls within that purview. Um, it honors the legacy of J. Richard Williams Sr., who was a Tulane University graduate, and he was a very well-known internist and oncologist in Selma, Alabama. Uh, for those of you who know uh, oncology back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, much of it was palliative care because effective treatment was uh, sparse and um, Sometimes we were caring for the patient rather than curing them. We always care for our patients, but sometimes all we could do was care for our patients. Um, so Dr. Williams loved medicine and was the kind of doctor who would do anything for his patient. And with a quote, interest in the impact of spirituality on health, particularly on the positive impact of spirituality on the well-being and continued health of those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. I'll now turn this over to Dr. Stephen Hansen, who is the Director of Graduate Studies for our MS in Bioethics and Medical Humanities, who co-sponsors this lecture. Right, thank you. And we, yes, I say we, we are co-sponsors along with the, the uh, Williams Fund. Um, we, I, I don't want to, do too much time here. I don't want to take much time away from it. So we are, you can get a lot of information about our program on the web, tulane.edu slash bioethics, and you can find out all kinds of stuff about us. We also have a number of uh, talks where we're giving you more information about us, or sometimes some of these talks are available on uh, YouTube, Tulane Bioethics, or you can find them also from the tulane.edu slash bioethics webpage under video views. Who are we? Well, this is a master of science program. We have two correlated uh, and related tracks, um, one bioethics and one medical humanities. We sort of think that there's so much in bioethics and medical humanities that we need to separate the tracks out a little bit. So if you can take a master's in bioethics or a master's in medical humanities, the bioethics track will prepare you for doing ethics in medicine whether that means clinical ethics, research ethics, IRBs, or simply practicing good medicine. We also have the medical humanities track, which prepares you to think about what are the ways that we think about medicine in non-scientific and non-ethical, uh, not specifically ethical language. What does the history of medicine tell us? What does narrative tell us? What does literature and, and art tell us that we can understand about medicine? And we can understand medicine better than simply through the scientific ways. So we try to give you both of these. And certainly anybody who graduates gets some of both of these. But the focus, you can focus on one or the other. Um, you can take our master's program in one or two years. And we, or more, by the way, so for people who are trying to look at this in a, as faculty development and mid-career professional level, you don't have to be taking even as fast as two years. Um, or 
for people who are looking at a dual degree MDMS, we can do that in the full in the same four years that you would take your to get your MD. You can graduate with both an MD and an MS. And very exciting, we now also have graduate certificates. So people who don't want a full master's program but simply want to dip your toe in, you can take a certificate in clinical ethics, research ethics, or medical humanities. And even more exciting, to me anyway, you can also build on that. If you dip your toe in and you decide you want more, you can take one of these certificates and add on to it, get a second certificate, or even go for the full master's degree at that point, and the same credit hours will count. Like I said, I don't want to go on and on about this. I want to just sort of say, hey, we're really excited about this. If this is something that interests you, by all means, get in touch with me or Dr. Ofengenden, who is our program manager. Um, and we'd be glad to answer more questions. Uh, and also, again, Tulane.edu slash bioethics. That is who we are. And you can find out more about us there. Uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and hand this then over to one of our fine students, Vidra Turi, who is, has uh, basically helped us uh, make this talk happen. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vid. I'm a student in the uh, Bioethics and Medical Humanities MS program. Um, it's my, uh, I just also want to say thank you guys so much for coming and joining this talk. Uh, it's my honor to um, introduce my mentor, Dr. Niyogi, and I'm just going to give a brief introduction before we begin. Uh, so, you stop sharing. Good. Sorry. Would you like me to stop sharing this, or are you good? Um, I'm good with this, and then Dr. Niyogi can share her PowerPoint. Uh, so, Dr. Niyogi is an associate professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the Tulane School of Medicine. She's also an adjunct assistant professor at the Tulane School of Public Health, and she's a professor in social entrepreneurship at the Phyllis M. Taylor Center. She's a volunteer physician with the Asylum Network with Physician for Human Rights, uh, for, and she's a co-founder and co-director of the Resident Initiative in Global Health at Tulane. Dr. Niyogi is also the founding director of the formerly incarcerated Transitions Clinic program which links people transitioning out of incarceration with medical care and re-entry services in the community. She has worked in over a dozen countries focusing on medical capacity building and humanitarian aid. So without further ado, Dr. Niyogi, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Thank you everybody for that introduction and for letting us know about your very exciting program. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, let's see. All right. Can everybody see that? Great. All right. Um, so I will just get started. Uh, again, Dr. Niyogi, I have no financial disclosures. And just review kind of, I'm going to split this up, this talk up into a couple of different sections. So first, we're going to just review the state of incarceration in the United States and focus a little bit on the racial disparities um, of incarceration rates in our country. And then we'll talk about how incarceration and health are linked um, and some of the statistics around um, health inequities for incarcerated uh, patients. And then we'll talk a little bit more about, as us providers in the community, um, what are some of the, the unique situations that we encounter as we're taking care of incarcerated people. So I picked this up. This is um, a picture of Big Charity. Um, many of you probably know this. And I just throw this up there to give you an idea of how I got started in doing this work. So. I have trained at charity and trained through the charity system. And for those of you that may not know, the Department of Corrections, Louisiana Department of Corrections, oftentimes has their own hospital. So we have, Angola has its own hospital. Uh, Hunt has its own hospital with its own um, ICU. Dixon has dialysis. So there's lots of things that the Department of Corrections can do within their own systems. However, when, the, when someone needs a higher level of care, then those patients are transferred oftentimes to a contract hospital. And so we in New Orleans, Charity University and now University Medical Center have always been a contract hospital for the Department of Corrections. So throughout my training, I've taken care of incarcerated individuals. And 
one day a very astute third year medical student said, hey, what happens when people get out? And I, at that point, hadn't even really thought about incarceration, even though I was taking care of all of these incarcerated individuals. It never occurred to me what that meant. And I certainly hadn't thought about what it meant if they got released or when they got released. And so I started to look it up and I realized the answer was really nothing. Um, many people are released with $10. In that time, it was a check um, and a bus ticket. And people were released at all times of the day and night. And there were really no good reentry services in general and definitely no reentry services for people needing um, a continuity of health care. And so from there was, was born the FIT clinic or the formerly incarcerated transitions clinic. And I started to work um, with people who were coming out of incarceration and that just opened up a whole new world to me. And I really started to understand what incarceration in the United States meant and um, how, it, how it deeply affected not just individuals, but uh, families and communities as a whole. So that's a background of how I got started. And we'll talk a little bit about incarceration in the United States. So many of you may know this, um, the United States is the world's leader of incarceration. We incarcerate more people than any other country in the, United, in, in the entire world. In fact, one in 32 Americans is involved with the criminal legal system, whether that is currently incarcerated or on community supervision in the form of probation or, or parole. Within the United States, Louisiana, leads the, the incarceration for state. We, for, a, for a hot second, Oklahoma had overtaken us for the incarceration, number, the most incarcerated in the United States, but we have taken that title back again. And within Louisiana, uh, New Orleans and Orleans Parish incarcerates the most. So this is just a graph to show you where Louisiana stands from even in, within the United States itself. I'm gonna briefly sort of just talk about why we have such a high incarceration rate. And so I really like this graph. Um, if you look from 1920, which is when we started to keep incarceration or prison statistics until about 1970, 1980, the number of people who are incarcerated is about steady state. There's about 50,000 or sorry, 500,000 people that are incarcerated, you know, in all of those six, seven decades of time. But then in 1970 and 1980, a few things happened from a political standpoint. We have a, you know, we're just getting out of uh, having the civil rights movement and people are allowed to have voting rights that didn't have voting rights in the past. We're coming out of the Vietnam War and we have a presidency that's decided to, you know, elicit this war on drugs. And so what you see in 1980, when we really say that, hey, we're gonna have this war on drugs, we go from about 500,000 people that were incarcerated total in the United States to where we are today. And this graph only goes up to 2010. We're close, we're still pretty close to that in 2020 to a little bit lower in our numbers. I think we're at 2.1 million instead of 2.3 million. But this graph shows that the number of people that are incarcerated just for drug offenses is the same as we had in the entire United States for all, for all crimes for about you know, six decades or so. And so that's a pretty significant number. And then you can see that there's other things that kind of add on to it. So we have minimum sentencing for drugs and three strikes and truth and sentencing and all of these other legal mandates that continue to increase the duration of time that people are incarcerated and also the number of people that are incarcerated. I wanna throw this up. I don't know if anybody had a chance to read this article um, that had come out a while ago. And this is a quote from John Ehrlichman who is the domestic policy advisor to Nixon um, and what he said was that, you know, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Do we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And so it was pretty clear that this was a very strategic political move 
to increase, you know, to, to gain some, uh, for, for political gain. But what ended up happening and resulting as a process of this was that we ended up being the most incarcerated uh, country in the world. Uh, the 13th Amendment is, uh, I think, a really important amendment for all of us to know. What the 13th Amendment says is that uh, it abolishes slavery, except in one context. So it says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a, pun as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any other place subject to their jurisdiction. And so we have within our own constitution uh, a, uh, a amendment that allows for the continuation of slavery um, within our nation. Uh, I really like this picture and this quote. This quote was actually um, from one of the people that we've worked with in the past, a uh, formerly incarcerated individual. These pictures are from Louisiana State Penitentiary, which is also known as Angola. If you're not familiar with the prison or the, uh, the prison Angola, the name comes from its role as a former uh, plantation, as a former slave plantation. The majority of people who served on that plantation came from the country of Angola. And when the Department of Corrections took over as the um, took it over as a prison, uh, the name followed. So technically, it's called Louisiana State Penitentiary, but it is oftentimes referred to still as Angola. Uh, this quote talks about more than a century and a half later, men, mostly black and brown, are still forced to work in the fields. They still harvest cotton. They still don't get paid, and they still face punishment if they refuse to work. This just shows the racial disparities in incarceration. So this is the lifetime risk of incarceration. And what you can see is that if you are a black man, you have a one in three chance of being incarcerated or justice and, or criminal legal involved in your entire lifetime compared to all men, which is one in nine. So that's three times the risk. Same with black women versus all women. And then you can see that Latino men and Latino women are also at increased risk. This is in Louisiana specifically. And so when you look at our prison population, we have about 60% of Louisiana's uh, population is white um, and makes yet makes up only 30% of the prison population. Conversely, 32% of our state population is black but makes up 66% of um, our prison population. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about why that is. Why are why do we have these racial disparities when it comes to incarceration? And there's lots of different factors. So one is that there's just more policing. And so, you know, we've probably all heard this or seen this, but there are certain neighborhoods and certain communities that are more heavily policed than other neighborhoods. And so just having that police presence, while it may be served to protect in one way, it also serves to criminalize in another way. And so just having more policing leads to more arrests. Once people are arrested, they're more likely to be convicted. And this is really important. We talk about sort of pretrial detention and bail and bond go, go together hand in hand. And so what happens? So you get arrested, you go to jail. In our jail in, in New Orleans, the Orleans Justice Center, 95% of the people who are currently housed at Orleans Justice Center have not even been sentenced yet. So they've been arrested and they are sitting in jail awaiting their trial awaiting to have a sentence, awaiting to see if they get convicted or not convicted. So up until this point, according to the United States Constitution, they are innocent because they have not been proven guilty. And yet they sit in those jails um, and get the health care that they would get in a jail setting. So how does this affect people getting the, the having racial disparities in incarceration? So you get arrested, you go to jail, you're sitting in jail, you're waiting for your sentencing, You've been there, maybe it's been a couple of days, maybe it's been a couple of weeks, maybe it's been a couple of months. All of those times when you're in there, you're losing your job, potentially, certainly losing income, perhaps being separated from your family and your friends and your communities. And so all of these things are weighing on you as you're sitting there. And then the DA comes and says, you know what, if you just take this plea deal, if you just pled guilty to this, 
we will give you time served, which means you can walk out of this jail today or tomorrow. And so if you've already been separated from your communities, you're already worried about what's going to happen with your income and supporting your family, you might take that deal, right? Because then you get freedom tomorrow. So now you have a guilty conviction, even if you're innocent, simply to get out. And that ties in with the bail and bond. So why are these people in jail? Why are they not out free awaiting their trial, awaiting their sentencing? And that's because we have this bail and bond system. And so once you're in, the fear is that, oh, you're going to, you know, abandon, you're going to leave town, you're going to run away, even though the data has never supported that. And so we make you pay to have your freedom. But if you don't have money, if you come from poverty, which oftentimes these neighborhoods are poor socioeconomic statuses, um, then you may not be able to pay for your bail. And so again, poverty leading to the increased time you're in jail, leading to these uh, plea deals and pleading guilty. And then once you're convicted, you're more likely to have a, a lengthy sentence. Now you've got a conviction. Let's say you get arrested again, something happens. People say, oh, you know what? He's already got a record, even though you might've been innocent and you took that plea deal. And so then all of those sentences start to add up. All right. Um, I'm going to focus now on incarceration and health for a moment. So here's some statistics about um, health care in prisons. So people who are incarcerated tend to have higher rates of illnesses in general. So chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, two to three times increased risk compared to the general population. Infectious diseases and mental illnesses Five to, time, five to 10 times increased risk. And we saw that recently with COVID. And so we saw how COVID really ran through and affected people who were in um, institutional settings. Also, the prison population is aging. We have a large number of people who are getting older just sitting in prison. And that means that they're getting sicker also. So 70% of people who, get, who are eventually released have at least one chronic medical condition. And then... Um, uh, we know that for every year that you are incarcerated, there's a two-year reduction in life expectancy. And so I put all of these things up. So, you know, if we look at the whole trajectory of how this happened, you know, poverty, race, all of these things contribute to more likely to be arrested. Once you're arrested, you're more likely to be, you know, have these lengthy sentences and now you're in prison. And what we see is once you get to prison, you get sicker you die earlier, and you're more likely to just have illnesses. So there are some legal mandates for healthcare in prison. Um, 1976 was a landmark case, Estelle versus Gamble. Um, so many of you have probably heard that, that people who are incarcerated um, have a constitutional right to healthcare, and that is true, and that comes from Estelle versus Gamble. And what they found was that not providing healthcare in um, in prisons and jails constituted cruel and unusual punishment and that violated the Eighth Amendment. And this is because, you know, once you're once you're locked away, somebody puts you, you know, you go to prison, they lock the door and then they are responsible for everything that happens to you while you're incarcerated, your meals, your clothing, everything that happens to you is their responsibility, including health care. And so now if you're locked away and you get sick, and they don't provide health care, and you get sicker or you die, then that's considered cruel and unusual punishment. On an international level, there's also something called the colloquially known as the Nelson Mandela rules, but it's the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. And rule 24 specifically talks about health care and, uh, and mandates that the provision of health care for prisoners is a state responsibility and that uh, further goes to state that prisoners should enjoy the same standards of health care as those available in the community. And I'll come back to that again in a minute. On a local level, uh, there was a case that was brought uh, and won in 2021 called the Lewis B. Kane. It is open and public. I'm happy to share the findings from that case if anyone is interested. Um, but it talks specifically, it was against the Louisiana State Penitentiary and once again found that LSP violated the Eighth Amendment by providing inadequate health care to people who are incarcerated at, um, at LSP or Angola currently and that they uh, need to do a better job of ensuring that there is adequate health care. 
So we'll just talk a little bit about how healthcare works in correctional settings and some of the um, some of the the issues that come up. So first and foremost, you know, security and um, correctional officers are there during clinical visits. Copays we'll talk about. We'll talk about an EMT triage system and uh, malingering. So during a clinical visit, you know, the the way that it works, you have different healthcare provisions in the jail. So one, you have chronic care management. So it's called the CC, you know, chronic care clinic. And so you could go to a chronic care clinic for your hypertension or your diabetes. Sometimes they're together. Sometimes they're separate. You know, an officer comes to you in the dorm and says, takes you to the, to the clinic. Oftentimes you're shackled during that time. Sometimes you're shackled while you're in your clinic visit. Um, and always there's one to two security officers that are present. And so when you think about this, you know, as clinicians, our role is to provide the most humane care to our patients that would provide, that would allow them to have the best outcome for whatever illness they have. And so if you don't have that trust with your, with your physician and, and you're not able to speak freely, about what's happening with you, it's going to degrade that relationship and it's going to lead to worse outcomes. You don't have this trust. You don't feel like you can just say what it is because you have the security officer. And in prisons, you know, the correctional officers and the security officers have a lot of power. I mean, they're the people who get to make these disciplinary decisions. And so if you have, if you have a beef with the CEO that happens to be taking you to the clinic, you are not going to speak up freely. And all of those things lead to worsening of, of health outcomes. We talked about copays, so I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but you, even though it is a constitutional right that you get health care in prison, there is no constitutional right that that health care is free or affordable. And so in the state of Louisiana, our, we have copays for everything when people are, um, are seen. So there is a prescription copay. You have to pay $2 per medication that you need. If you have a sick call, um, you have to pay $3. And if you have an emergency, you have to pay $6. And $2, $3, $6 may not seem a lot to us, but in the context of how much you're earning in prison, it adds up to be a lot. So the, on average, people who are incarcerated in the state of Louisiana make about four cents an hour. And so if you're making four cents an hour and we have this table on the right, you know, it's six days of pay to pay for one $2 prescription and 19 days of pay to pay for your emergency visit. Um, there's a, there's a triage system. So what happens you're, you know, let's say you are, um, you get sick and you make a sick call let's say you're out in the field and you are starting to feel dizzy, it's hot, it's Louisiana, it's you know August, it's September, maybe you haven't had enough water to drink, you're out, you're working, you start to feel dizzy and you say, hey, you know, I need to see a doctor. The first person that comes to you is an EMT, same as you know, out in the community. But the EMT comes and the first person that the EMT speaks to is that man, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but you see all these people that are out there working in the fields. And then there's a man who's sitting on a horse. The person who's sitting on the horse, even in 2022 is called the overseer. So the EMT goes straight and first talks to the overseer and says, hey, is this guy legit? Is he really sick? And the triage happens between security and the EMT. Until recently, many of the EMTs at Louisiana State Penitentiary were also correctional officers. And so you can imagine the, the power differential between those. And so they would take a weekend course or up to six months of a course to become an EMT and would moonlight as EMTs. So again, going back to, you gotta be for the correctional officer, you're saying that you're sick. The EMT comes and says, uh-uh, it's not legit. I don't think it's legit. EMT, you know, the overseer says that. And then the EMT, perhaps goes away, may or may not even see the patient um, who's out there. And this quote that I have, oh, sorry. This quote that I have is um, from some interviews that we had done, uh, which basically says, you know, you see this, the EMT instead of seeing the physician, the EMT is just trying to keep you from seeing a physician, figure out what you need um, instead of giving it to you. 
Um, and then, so then what happens? So what happens if the EMT decides that you are, uh, that it's not legit, you know, that you are just there because you're, uh, because nobody, you, you know, because uh, you want to get out of work detail. That's oftentimes the, the, the reason that people are given is that, oh no, you know, he's just faking having his, his back hurt because he's trying to get out of work detail. And this is another quote that somebody had told us, you know, everybody thinks like you fake like you're hurting. Why would anybody want to fake like they're hurting? Nobody's going to take care of you anyway. And so, in oftentimes in the prison healthcare system, the first differential is actually of malingering. You know, we're taught in medical school in our clinical practice that malingering is often the diagnosis of exclusion. And yet in these settings, it is um, the, the first differential oftentimes. And if you are deemed to be malingering, then there's punitive measures. And so this punitive measures might be loss of commissary. So commissary is where, you know, people use um, money for their phone calls to family and friends their, you know, food. Oftentimes people tell me that they're treating each other, you know, they make these, these home sort of recipes and they buy things from commissary and make, make these um, traditional or folk, uh, folk med medicines for one another because they have such little trust and faith in the healthcare system to care for them that they just do it for themselves. Loss of visitation. So let's say, you know, you've been waiting for your aunt who lives three hours away, as many of you know, our prisons are in rural settings away from urban settings, oftentimes difficult to get to. It takes about two to three hours to get to LSP from New Orleans, for example. And transportation is difficult. There's no public transportation systems that, that go there. So let's say, you know, your aunt's been planning this visit for a few months. She's finally got the transportation together, the time off of work. Uh, she's got somebody who might be taking care of the kids and she's been, you know, planning this for some time. Now you get sick and you have to decide, am I going to call the EMT? Am I going to, am I going to make a sick call? Because what if I make a sick call and they don't believe me and they say you're malingering and then they take away my visitation. My aunt's been planning for three months to come and see me. I might not get to see her. I haven't seen her in, you know, however long period of time. And so all of those things are disincentives for people to actually access healthcare um, while they're there. You might get additional work detail. And then there have been reports of people who have been placed in solitary confinement. And this picture is a cell of solitary confinement. So you can see the six by six cell. Um, and people have been there for uh, you know, varying periods of time, but there's plenty of data and literature that shows that even one day in solitary confinement has negative effects in both physical and mental health. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about how the prison system, you know, you know, we think back to the Nelson Mandela rules that say, you know, the state is obligated to provide health care and that those health care standards should be aligned with your community standards. And so we can look to see kind of how, you know, describing what healthcare works like in prisons, it may not be the same as what we would expect in the, in the community. So first and foremost, you know, an EMT system of triage. While in the United States, you call 911, the ambulance comes, the EMTs come, and they check you out. EMTs never are doing triage on their own. Right. If the patient doesn't want to come to the hospital, the EMT still calls the hospital and speaks to the ER physician on call and says this person is declining to come. But an EMT on their own would never say, oh, you don't really need to go to the hospital. I don't think you need to go. That would not be allowed. And it is out of the standard of practice for EMTs. The second is excessive co-pays. I know we talk a lot about access to healthcare and the rising costs of healthcare. Um, and still that we have provisions out in the community. So whether that's the form of insurance like Medicaid or other insurance forms or FQHCs or sliding scales, we have provisions to assist people in, in being able to afford healthcare services. While not ideal, we do have something in place. You know, we talked about the excessive co-pays in the prison system and up to 19 days of work just to um, go and be seen for an emergency. In the state of Louisiana, two thirds of our physicians have license restrictions, um, have their own felony convictions and are not allowed to practice out in the community. 
Uh, we've been told various reasons for why that is, but the one that has that has been the most consistent is that Medicaid will not reimburse for uh, physicians work with restricted licenses. And so one of the only systems in the state of Louisiana where you don't rely on Medicaid reimbursement is the prison system. But again, these physicians are not allowed to practice out in the communities. I 100% believe everyone deserves a second, third, fourth chance. Um, and those chances should be equal physicians should be allowed to practice in the communities if they're allowed to practice in prisons, but should not be allowed to practice in prisons if they're not allowed to practice in the communities. Um, there's no choice in prisons. You go to the doctor, whether it's a sick call, a, a chronic care um, clinic, or an emergency, you get who you get. And so whether you trust them, you don't trust them, there's no option to get a second opinion, which is not consistent with what we have in the, in, out in the community and then punitive measures and the you know out in the community you have to do a whole lot before you are turned away from a clinic um, and even if you are going to turn someone away or fire them quote unquote from your clinic there's a lot of different measures um, that we do to provide uh, to protect patients in that whereas in the prison system you know one episode or one diagnosis whether accurate or not of malingering can lead to pretty significant punitive measures I'm gonna switch briefly to talk about considerations in hospitalized settings. So as um, a physician who works at University Medical Center, which is, like I said, a contract hospital for DOC, I do regularly see patients who are currently uh, incarcerated. And so there's certain things that we sort of think about, you know, again, I think for, for me personally, and I think as educators and people who are training others, whether it's our colleagues or medical students to take care of this population of people. It is important for us to remind ourselves and others that our first duty should be as physicians and medical providers and that our lens should take on the lens of a physician and advocate for our patients on that behalf. One of the questions that I'm oftentimes asked um, is about informed consent. And so Informed consent in the state of Louisiana for someone who is incarcerated works the same as informed consent for any other patient, whether they are incarcerated or not, which means if they have medical capacity to make medical decisions, they are their own decision makers. I have had surgeons come up to me and say, well, this person doesn't want to go to surgery and they're saying no, they're incarcerated, you know, they're, how can they say no? And, you know, it's our duty to remind people that um, it is still their own body and that, um, and that we all have, you know, autonomy of, over our own bodies. Um, another consideration is shackling. So many of you, if you work in, you know, systems that take care of incarcerated patients, they are handcuffed or foot cuffed to their beds 23 to 24 hours a day. Um, and so it is important for us to remember what does that mean, you know, and so one practice that I've utilized is sort of looking to make sure that those um, that those shackles aren't cutting into people's arms and legs. And so oftentimes people leave hospital settings with um, with worsened skin conditions simply because of the friction of what they've had. I oftentimes will, you know, ask for physical therapy to come in to see the patient, talk with the nurses, talk with the security guards to see what we can do to get people out. We've had patients who have wanted to leave the hospital against medical advice because let's say they've come in to, to get a colonoscopy and we're giving them cathartics to clear their bowels and they're having to go to the bathroom frequently, but they're now they're cuffed to their bed and can't make it to the bathroom fast enough. And so they're soiling themselves on their bed, which just adds to the further degraded degradation that they already feel, you know, the, the shame, the humiliation, the, and how, how degrading it must be to be soiling yourself when you can make it to the bathroom or not allowed to. Again, this concept of con confidentiality comes in. So when we're working on these fields and, you know, UMC actually does have its own contained unit. It's got the uh, controlled access unit, which is a locked unit. And yet we have patients that are cuffed and then security officers who are present during your entire visit with the patients. And so we've been working a lot about, you know, how do we do that? How do we advocate for our patients, maintain HIPAA, maintain that patient, um, that patient physician confidentiality and trust and really be able to get our patients to both open up to us and for us to share medical information with them that is not the 
that the security doesn't need to know. They can just share what security they want to, but it isn't necessarily beholden to security to be privy to all of those conversations. And, you know, DOC will oftentimes present security as superseding patient privacy, but I think as physicians, it, it is our obligation to sort of talk about how those two um, roles can coexist um, more effectively. And so one of the things that I've been doing at UMC is, you know, speaking to the to the security guards and just asking them to step out. I've been told they need to have a line of, of vision and so they can still protect me if I need protection. They can see me, the door can be open, but I ask them to step outside. It goes a long way in, in ensuring that your patients understand that we are respecting them and placing them at the forefront of the relationship. Um, Visitation. So this is another thing, whether it's phone calls or end of life visitation or in person visitation for other reasons, uh, there seems to be uh, a uh, an idea that once patients are in the hospital, for some reason, all of the rights that they had, you know, whatever limited rights they had in the in the prisons don't apply anymore. And this applies to like phone calls. So a lot of times patients, especially if they're undergoing surgeries or, you know, different medical procedures, they want to talk to their friends or they want to talk to their families. They want to engage them in those decision-making. It's a really frightening thing to be in a hospital and to, you know, have to make all of these decisions. And of course you want to involve the ones that are closest to you in these decisions. And yet we make it very difficult. And oftentimes we're told no. At University Medical Center, we just have a, a, a guideline in, in place to assist people with how to do that. And we've been working with DOC and security to ensure that when people are incarcerated, that we're allowing them the same rights and the same phone calls that we would have otherwise. And then end of life becomes another, um, another time when it's really important to make sure that the loved ones are around. And then medical parole and compassionate release, you know, as providers in um, at, at a contract hospital, we oftentimes see patients that are coming in very much at the end of end of life or when their Ill illnesses have significantly advanced. We don't see them early on. And if you read that Lewis v. Cain um, case against LSP, it gives a really good insight into how operations work within the DOC and why are we seeing people so late in their diseases. Why are people complaining of back pain for two years, three years, four years before they finally get an MRI that shows metastatic cancer um, and spinal meds? And so, you know, as physicians, again, if our role is to advocate for people to be to uh, to have the best possible outcomes and we're advocating for them to, to, to provide humane, compassionate care then part of that is our obligation as physicians to advocate for medical parole and compassionate release for people and so that they would have access to care outside of the prison system um, and to be with family and to be with friends and to have more visitation and all of those things as they're ending the near uh, and nearing the end of their, of their life. I'm gonna briefly talk about incarceration and COVID risk. So we talked about this earlier on the left is the number of patients with COVID. This is a little bit outdated. Um, this is from 2020, but as you can see uh, the US population versus the prison population and the number of, of patients with COVID. And then on the right are these graphs. And so um, the light blue are people are incarcerated people with COVID. The orange are correction staff, and then the U.S. is population. And I put this up there just so that people remember that the correction staff and people who are working in corrections are also affected by infectious diseases, and particularly, you know, COVID. And so these, the correction staff is going back and forth from your communities. And so they're coming into the prison, and then they're going back into the community, and they're coming back. And so there's this, this pipeline, there's this sort of bilateral exchange of infectious diseases that's going back and forth. And so even though, you know, we might have uh, people who say, well, I don't really care about those people, you know, those criminals, they're all locked away. And, you know, why should I care about their risk of getting, you know, COVID? Um, it's sometimes useful to remind people that people who are who are working there are also at risk, but they're bringing that risk back to their communities, back to their churches, back to you know, the restaurants in which they're eating. 
This is a picture of um, Louisiana State Penitentiary of Angola. I put this up here. Um, I don't know if anyone's uh, had a chance to visit a prison or not, but this is sort of a general dorm. This is what it looks like. And I put this up so that we can remember, you know, the COVID risk. So six feet apart, social distancing, aeration, all of those things that we had advocated for that the CDC guidelines told us would minimize risk is really not possible in the prison system. These bunk beds, there's one on top of the other, they're bolted down, you can't spe separate them out. And so a lot of times people are in very, very close proximity. You can see that the windows are closed. Oftentimes there's just a fan. Sometimes the windows open depending on what dorm you're in, oftentimes they don't. And so it's really hard to separate people. The CDC guideline for correctional facilities was to then have people sleep head to toe and so one person's head would be on one side and it would be other person's feet. But as we all know, having taken care of so many COVID patients at this time, that that's really not adequate to keep people from being infected um, with COVID. Again, this is a pill call line. And so when it's time to take your medications, everybody gets called up together. Everyone's standing in this line, um, very close proximity to one another, increasing the risk of COVID. Um, briefly, I'm going to talk about collateral consequences. So this is what does it mean? So 95% of people who are incarcerated do eventually get released. And when they get released and come back into the community, they continue to suffer consequences of their incarceration in multiple different ways. And this affects us as clinicians and healthcare providers because of the ways it affects the social determinants of health. And so many things you're not able to access because you have a felony record. In Louisiana, until very recently, if you had a drug, drug conviction, you couldn't get SNAP benefits, you couldn't get food stamps. And so we had people who were coming in very vulnerable, oftentimes with no money because you're not earning any money in prison and then putting and then getting them out and then not even giving them access to food. There are lots of housing discrimination, employment uh, discrimination, education discrimination, lots of different ways. Um, I put these two up, you know, particularly social determinants of health. I don't know if the um, if the title came through, but so on the left is how incarceration affects employment rates. And so what you can see, uh, the sort of gray, blue gray lines are people who are formerly incarcerated versus the black, which is the general population. And so if you're a black woman who's got a history of incarceration, the chances of you getting a job are very, very, very slim. And all of this shows the huge disparities in employment with the felony record. And then on the right is rates of homelessness. And so again, you can see, you know, people who are uh, formally incarcerated, if you just look at the orange on the very left, the general public versus formally incarcerated and the incredibly high rates of homelessness. And this is bilateral. So some of the, you know, some of the studies do show that many people who are incarcerated were homeless before and that it wasn't necessarily incarceration that created homelessness, but then it's important for us to think about the criminalization of homelessness as well. And so how are we perpetuating this cycle? Um, this is a good graph. I'll, you know, I'm happy to share this. This just is a, um, was part of a health affairs health policy brief. I won't go through all of it, but it does a good job of sort of breaking down the social determinants of health and the ways in which those uh, interfere with both successful reentry, but also with health. And that is it. That was my last slide. So I am happy to I'll stop sharing and can have any discussion or answer any questions. Yeah, if people want to put any questions in the chat or they want to raise their hands, um, you can ask questions through that. We can call on you if you raise your hand. Um, Raya in the chat is asking if the slides will be shared. I'm happy to, to share the slides. Um, I'll share them with you, Vid, if you want to distribute them. Yeah, definitely. And then Emma is asking if there are specific specialties that are most needed. Um, so psychiatry and general medicine are probably the two, two greatest ones to take care of the general day-to-day. -day. Obviously there are multiple specialties um, that people need, you know, oncology, all of those things, but to take care of day-to-day -day people who are incarcerated, um, 
I think having a really, really strong background in primary care, that's one of the things that we've been advocating for is that people should be trained to do the job they're going to do, which is to provide primary care. Uh, John is asking, what was the statistic regarding the percentage number of physicians in the state of Louisiana who have had their licenses restricted? Two thirds. 67%. And that was um, confirmed by a public records request that we've done. Angela is asking, is there a copay to transport patients to their appointments at UMCNO? There, there's not a copay to transport patients, um, but it's very difficult to get patients to, to their appointments. And I can just very briefly speak, you know, the way that it happens, if you are a, if you're at UMC, we make a recommendation that you need to have a follow-up appointment. That follow-up appointment recommendation goes to the medical director and the treating physician at the prison. It then goes to headquarters. Headquarters decides whether or not to, to approve that. And then if they approve it, they have to coordinate with security and the clinic or wherever they're gonna go. And so oftentimes these things get significantly delayed. Thank you. Um, Michael is asking, how do you handle end of life decisions uh, decision making with pri uh, in prisoners, uh, DNR, et cetera, do they retain all the usual rights? They do retain all the usual all the usual rights. We've been working with the prisons to try to do um, advanced directives and um, and wills and uh, sorry, not wills, advanced directives and end of life planning while they're there. You know, oftentimes people trust the, those that they've been incarcerated with for decades more than they would trust any of the rest of us. Um, but when they do come to the hospital, they absolutely maintain their own decisions and we work really hard to engage with, um, with family. And so, you know, you call the warden, you say, is this person on their visitation right? You call the, you call the, uh, the family and engage them as best as you can. Great, thank you. Uh, Sonal is asking, are there any resources or organizations that medical students can learn more about working with prison populations? Uh, so one of the best organizations that I know of that is our co-founder with the FIT Clinic is called VOTE, Voice of the uh, Experienced. And it was an organization started in Angola by two people and continued on on the outside that do a lot of advocacy and legislative work. And I did see something else, I think it was from Keith and about, uh, you know, how to improve conditions. I do quickly want to say because we have bills in right now. And so everyone can can call their their representatives and senators. We have three bills in legislation. This legislative session, I'm actually going to Baton Rouge tomorrow to testify on one of them. One is to expand medical parole. Um, right now, there are certain crimes that you can't get parole for. And so we're saying if you're at end of life, your criminal history shouldn't really matter, that we should advocate for everyone on an equal basis. Um, one is to uh, try to get rid of the copay system or minimize it. So no copays for prescriptions and decreased copays for everyone for emergencies and um, sick visits. And then the third is to have a medical advisory council. Kate is asking, uh, what are the current regulations for incarcerated women and giving birth while incarcerated? And to follow that up, Rye is also asking, can you please mention the state of women in prison systems? Yeah, so um, there are only about, I think, 23 states, only half, half the states have any rules or regulations around uh, taking care of pregnant patients while they are incarcerated. Um, and so we are a no shackling state. That was a very, very recent change. Up until very recently, we did sh shackle incarcerated women during childbirth. Um, the theory behind shackling is that in the midst of labor, the woman's gonna run away, which I don't know how many mothers we have on this call, but, you know, or fathers, um, it is a very difficult thing to do. Um, and then, you know, in prison systems overall, women are very often overlooked. One, because we haven't had a lot of women in prison, but that number is changing. We have more and more women in prison. It's the highest group of, of uh, people who are getting incarcerated currently. And they are very special, needs of women. Most, almost every woman, I would say 90 something percent of women have had 
trauma, have experienced either sexual or physical trauma. And so mental health is a really large thing that's overlooked, cervical cancer screening, um, other, you know, STS, there's other, there are other needs that women have that are oftentimes uh, overlooked because we focus so much on men and men's needs. Uh, Ronika is asking, do you know if other states employ physicians that cannot practice in the community? What is the rationale for this in Louisiana? Yeah, so there's one or two other states that do do this. Um, I think Arkansas is one, and I forget the other one. They utilize uh, psychiatrists who uh, are not fully licensed. In Louisiana, we've been told it's because it's so difficult to recruit physicians to go and work in prison systems. Um, whereas, you know, we feel that if we were to pay, if the prisons were to pay um, a better salary, they would be able to recruit because I do think that there are a large number of people who care for this population who really are guided from a principal perspective and would love to work in prison settings and that we should be uh, utilizing their, their passion and their experience. And you know, if we were able to restructure the, the repayment, then we would be able to attract a, a large number of, of physicians without restrictions on their licenses. Okay, uh, Patricia is asking who and what groups are advocating for improvements in patient care? Have we seen any change um, in our improvements uh, in the conditions? Yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the largest successes that we've had or largest groups that has been advocating has been Promise of Justice Initiative. It's a legal firm that works to, um, to represent individuals and in class action for better health care in the prison systems. They've worked really hard. They're the ones that brought up the Lewis B. Gain case. Vote, again, Voice of the Experienced is our, is our community partner, and we do a lot of legislative work and advocacy work. You know, UMC Hospital um, has been tremendously supportive in, um, in our efforts and has really worked well in trying to kind of get us all to you know, recognize our role as providers. Um, the Fit Clinic works with votes to, to do a lot of things to improve care for people that are incarcerated. But the majority is going to come. I mean, you know, having done this now for several years, really utilizing our legal partners and our advocacy partners and going to legislation and bringing this forth. There was a wonderful report that came out from Robert Wood Johnson about a year or two ago. It was about Louisiana uh, prisons. Uh, Bruce Riley, Andrea Armstrong, and Ashley Winterstrom were the co-authors of it. And they looked at what's happening in the prison systems throughout all of the prisons in Louisiana. I, um, I could share that um, as well. And then um, there's another website called Death Behind Bars that is run by Andrea Armstrong, who's a law professor at uh, Loyola, who's been uh, documenting all of the deaths that happen within our jail and prison system. And so I think movements like that and really trying to have more transparency in what's happening behind bars and remembering the patients. You know, I think a lot of times people are sort of shoved away into these rural areas and the doors are locked and we forget about them. And I think that all of us in this group can continue to advocate and remember that these are, you know, there are community members, there are patients, they have families, they have children, you know, children are affected by this in lots of different ways. Um, and I think a lot of people in the chat have been asking similar questions, um, being uh, what can healthcare providers do um, to uh, mitigate such issues occurring? Um, and even more so, what can you know, just everyone do in general? Yeah, I think that, you know, we've been a lot of the people who've been medical experts and who've done correctional care to advocate for better uh, for better outcomes are retiring. And so we are definitely in need of physicians and clinicians and medical students who can take this on, who can really kind of feel committed to improving the care for, for people. Um, I think that as clinicians, you know, we can be, we, your white coat, I mean, I don't know how many people have testified in legislation before, but you know, you put on your white coat and legislators do like, they will listen to you. Um, and I think so just using your voice as much as possible, there's legislative days, you know, on, um, on uh, in Capitol Hill, but also if you're interested, Vote has a monthly meeting. Everyone is welcome to those monthly meetings and getting to know some of the work that's happening and getting to know some of the people 
um, that are doing some of this work and just really using your voice. Medical students, are, like our community, our profession is instrumental in making these changes. And one of the things that I've been really advocating for, and I think that as a medical community, if we could come together and advocate for this is to take healthcare out of the hands of safety and put it into the hands of the Department of Health where all medical care really should be. And so why are safe, why is safety making decisions, Department of Corrections and Public Safety making healthcare decisions when it really should be, you know, LDH. And so really having um, starting to advocate for what we believe is the best for our patients. Awesome. And then this is the last question. Uh, are there any tuition forgiveness opportunities for physicians or mid-level providers to serve as prison healthcare providers to erase student debt? And that was asked by Michelle. That's a really good question. I don't know about any loan repayment programs. I do know that in the past, there have been a couple of physicians who have come on work visas from other countries and so on a J-1, um, and they've accepted those. I don't know if there's any loan forgiveness for the prisons, but that's a really good question that um, I will pose actually to, to the DOC. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Bid, for, for thank handling that. Much. That was a great job. Um, uh, and actually, I have a thought uh, on the loan forgiveness. I'll, I'll maybe drop you an email so that there might be a way because it is a state uh, uh, institution. And so that that maybe ah, whether the comment saying some in other states, but not in Louisiana. Well, there you are. Um, OK, well, in any case, um, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for for attending. This will be available uh, once we get it posted on Tulane.edu slash bioethics. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Niyogi, for, for a wonderful talk. Thank you.